So we've got all sorts of informations on which market economies rely that have to be tolerably accurate. Not perfect, but tolerably accurate, not systematically inaccurate. So now we have prices and accountancy going awry. The next is a familiar story, the credit rating agencies. The, the story, I think we all know, it's the why. And I'm not convinced that we've got the why yet. But credit rating firms did once operate in competitive markets, and their wealth depended, at least in part, on their reputation, that is, the capital value of their firms, was, of a credit rating firm, is largely its reputation. They now operate, however, as government-mandated oligopolies. In 1975, the SEC implemented the nationally recognized rating organization category. Money managers, money market funds, and others had to make use of the ratings of the three agencies, Standard & Poor's, Moody's, and Fitch. Then the Credit Rating Reform Act of 2006 tightened their grip on the market. Ed Cain has argued that, in effect, the Securities and Exchange Commission delegated to the credit rating agencies supervision over securitization. Instead of relying solely on profits from competitively supplied services, the agencies earned rents from shared monopoly power. Whether this institutional change alone can explain the massive grade inflation for mortgage-backed securities remains a subject of debate, but certainly the inflated credit ratings of mortgage-backed securities helped facilitate the housing bubble. Now, after I wrote, or at the very end, and I inserted a little notation on this in the paper, I discovered that this process had actually begun in the 1930s with bank regulators requiring that national banks, and then eventually all banks, use credit rating agencies. But actually, people knew what the bias was, and they, and they worked around the bias. They had evolved a system for working around the bias, which institutionally was forgotten and lost. And so when this thing excel when this things happened and uh, what just went through, um, the markets weren't doing what they were doing in the 30s to discount the bias. Basically, what the markets did in the 30s is they averaged the ratings. And the average of the ratings was a better predictor than any one of the ratings. OK. So <clears throat> actors need to rely on information transmitted by price and non-price signals. Those information flows are necessary conditions for achieving plan compatibility, particularly among intertemporal plan compatibility, and particularly in our new global economy. Um, in the housing boom, prices were distorted by the effects of monetary policy on interest rates. We now have an accounting profession whose goal is adherence to rules rather than truth-telling. There is an overarching principle in accounting that accounting statements must fair fairly and accurately portray the financial position of a company. In practice, however, the adherence to rules immunizes accountants from legal consequences of their bad opinions. And we have a credit rating process that, for whatever reason, became positively giddy in its assessment of housing-rated securities. I, I don't, it's now purely formal. Uh, certain institutions have to use these credit rating agencies. But if you talk to people, they're doing their own credit rating because nobody believes this stuff anymore. Uh, the market's mechanisms for conveying information about asset values, company profits, and credit risk cease to convey accurate information. Instead, they report inflated values for assets and the value of firms owning such assets. Plus, they understated the risk of those assets. Distorted prices, misleading accounting, and inflated, inflated credit ratings produced what I describe in a piece I wrote for the Wall Street Journal as an economy of liars. We all just started lying to each other. <laughs>